Welcome to ACC Nation, featuring sports news and special guest interviews. Here's Will Ojanen and Jim Quist. This is ACC Nation's Boston College Football Preview with one of the staff writers for 24-7 Sports, Eagle Insider, covering Boston College sports, obviously, here to share his thoughts on the 2020 version of Eagles football, our special guest, Mitch Wolf. Mitch, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Excited to be on to talk some about some more about the Eagles. Hey, I'm going to get into, uh, and I give you a little bit of a warning about this, but I'll give you another warning. Uh, at, all newbies get to talk about food, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I hope you've you've spent a little time thinking of something other than football for just a moment of maybe where your favorite place to eat, like at the game day or or maybe someplace else. But anyway, we'll get into that in just a moment. Hey, um, one of the things that um, – I guess outside of the circle, you know, this, this is one of the things that we get to see on a regular basis is that you that you have media coverage of of um, individual teams. And it's it's like its own bubble. Mm -hmm. When you get into the conference in any conference, I think is like this. Um, often you don't hear enough about other teams. So that's part of the reason why we're here. Uh, you guys have got a new coach, Bill O'Brien, and I really want to know, because I haven't heard a lot, what's the chatter among fans and supporters about Boston College under Bill O'Brien going into this season? Well, I'll answer your question in two parts, because I think there's two elements. To that. So the first part about the quote unquote bubble is that kind of in to reflect the image is BC exists in a kind of vacuum in terms of media coverage in Boston. Because, and if you think about it, especially this off season, because you have Bill Belichick being fired and them hiring a new coach, them drafting a quarterback in the top five, you have the Boston Celtics winning the NBA championship and then the Olympics and Jason Tatum and all that. Um, and then generally like the Red Sox and Bruins obviously get their fair share of coverage. So you just don't have a lot of coverage of BC football in general. And uh, also obviously college sports is just not as big in new England. Um, and frankly, I think there's a lot of people in England who kind of don't love BC. And you know, it's a smaller Catholic school um, that sure some people wanted to get into, but couldn't. And then they have some bad feelings about that. So, you know, a lot of people just kind of have this antipathy towards BC when they're when they don't have a certain player or fun story to root for, like you would have had with a Doug Flutie or a Matt Ryan or a Luke Keekley or something like that. So that's part of it. The other part, uh, just regarding Bill O'Brien, is you know, this was all kind of a big surprise for BC because going to the offseason, you know, they win the Fenway Bowl, which was kind of surprising against an SMU team that just won the American Athletic Conference, uh, had a very dynamic passing attack. But they come to Fenway. BC wins that game in the pouring rain. Uh, Jeff Halfley, the former head coach, had done a pretty good job getting talent in the transfer portal. And then end of January, almost out of nowhere. It's he and or it's announced that he's leaving to become the Packers defensive coordinator, which was very surprising to all of us. Um so that happens. And, you know, now with the calendar of how college sports works, you know, BC is kind of in flux because you're not in the transfer window, but now guys can transfer. So you can lose players. You just can't add any back for a while. Um, and they're just looking for a new head coach when everybody else is kind of finalized. So luckily they kind of fall bass backwards into Bill O'Brien, who had just taken the Ohio state offense corner job, basically days or, you know, weeks prior and had been there for a few days. And, you know, as be, I'm sure this goes to fans everywhere, but you know, you have that general cynicism about your team. It's like, oh, good things couldn't happen to us. We can't, we won't be able to figure this out. But it actually does happen that Bill O'Brien does decide to come here. Now he is a native of the area. He's from, I want to say, Andover, uh, so which is a few towns over from BC. Um, grew up in the area. Went to he played at Brown. His wife uh, went to BC. Uh, his family mostly still lives in the area because his son has a. I think it's his youngest son has a rare medical condition that is specifically treated at uh, Boston Children's Hospital, I believe. So he has a very strong connection in the area. And that's part of the reason why he wanted to come back. So, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, you know, Bill O'Brien wouldn't really take a head coaching job, but he would take BC's head coaching job because there are some special factors. Um, and for that reason, you know, BC is kind of able to luck into honestly upgrading head coach because Jeff Halfley came in and and he got a lot of them. He had a lot of momentum with the program, but then COVID hits and they do better than people think. They have an exciting offense. The next year, they lose the quarterback to injury. Things are up and down. The next year, they 
have a just really bad luck on the offensive line, have one of the worst offensive lines in the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. And then this year, things are a little up and down again. So with him, you saw somebody who it kind of became apparent that he was somebody who hadn't had any head coaching experience in his career. And the highest he had ever been was a defensive co-coordinator. With Bill O'Brien, you get a guy who's been a head coach in college, in the NFL. He's been a play caller. He's been uh, a pretty successful head coach. You know, the Texans, you know, are, I would say, an up and down franchise with him. They made the playoffs a bunch. Um, he had success with different types of quarterbacks, different types of offenses. Um, and then at Penn State, you know, he goes to Penn State as the head coach. And it's a very difficult situation there after Joe Paterno is uh, rightfully forced to retire in the wake of the Jerry Sandusky scandal. So and he's you know able to get that team to, I believe, two winning seasons before he left for the Texans job. So this is a guy who is used to working in difficult circumstances. And, you know, f- for all as much as I love BC as an alum, it is one of the more difficult jobs in college football because of the academic restrictions, because of the poor weather, because of the isolation relative to the rest of college football. And like I said, the relatively low media coverage in a professional sports town, which you can spin to say, hey, you're in the city of champions. You know, you have all these opportunities, all these different organizations. But at the end of the day, it's harder because, you know, you're going to a school that has 10,000 undergrads, some of which don't really care about football compared to you could go someplace elsewhere in the ACC where they have 40,000 undergrads and they're all there on Saturday afternoon screaming your screaming your name. So, you know, it's good to bring in a guy that has the experience and is willing and ready to take on the challenge that is the job of the job that is the Boston College football head coach. Yeah, that's a, a that's a really good good look at at Bill. Um uh I I think Jeff Halfley uh was a good coach of just a, in a perhaps not the best situation, as you point out, because of COVID. And uh, um, I think less of him today because I'm a Bears fan, and <laughs> anybody that goes to the Packers, uh, Will's a Vikings fan, anybody goes to the Packers. <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to begrudge anybody for taking more money to live in Green Bay than to live in Boston. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to give me a lot of money to live in Green Bay. <laughs> I don't think there's enough money in the world that would get me to move to Green Bay. <laughs> I'm just talking about it. I'm just talking about living cost of living. I mean, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah. that's yeah. a whole different thing. But uh, a lot of commuting going on. Yeah. There, so. But yeah. But even with with that, like with Halfley, even just the change in the college football that that com- that took place compared to when he took the job, which it happened. He takes the job a few months before COVID hits. Then you get NIL in the portal taking over college football, which he had cited as one of the reasons why he wanted to leave. Um, some people push back on that. I having talked to him a decent bit. It was more so about he wanted to get back to coaching football because right. For him, that's that's like the thing he loves most. Like he is a he is a football coach. Like he wants to teach people to play the game. And because of again, what I stated about BC's difficulty with these aspects of the job, he has to spend a lot more of his time, you know, uh, you know, um, drumming up donations, you know, re-recruiting the roster, you know, doing all this stuff that isn't being a football coach. And now, like I said, you're getting paid more money to go to a place where you'll get to keep more of that money to just coach football and just work six months out of the year as opposed to 11, which, and I, and he has, I think three young kids, I think they're all daughters. So again, I, it's hard for me to begrudge what he did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. No problem there. I mean, I, of course we just are uh, poking a little bit at him, but mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, Bill O'Brien. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's an absolute gem and uh, I, I think it worked out for both sides. Mm-hmm. And I, I really expect some interesting things to, to happen with, with bill because i think he's a hell of a coach to be honest with you he he as you point out from a to z this man has got his stuff going on let's get into uh what boston college is doing will it's all yours all right so for the bulk of the offense was thomas castellanos last year let, let's see i think mm-hmm. i did the math and i think he had a, a hand in about 40 percent of the offensive plays which is good if you're gonna if you're good at it which he mm-hmm. really was but at the same time you run the risk of injury mm-hmm. and and i know uh read that he's pretty much been one of the stories of practice he's been really really good but at the same time as hey are, are they gonna look to lo- lighten the load for him on offense maybe not ask him to run the ball as much I think they want to lighten the physical load while upping the mental load because like, like you said, he had it, he was the offense last year and which is surprising because he was, that wasn't the plan. He was not the starter in week one. He took over about halfway through the first half of the first game because the incumbent starter Emmett Moorhead was not getting it done and his ability to create out of structure with his legs, 
uh, create these explosive plays. And he has a very strong arm for a guy who's listed at 5'9", 196. Um, so that, so then basically the offense had to be kind of slapped together to reconnoiter what they were doing to better fit his skill set because Emmett Moorhead was 6'5", 240, pocket passer, and Camus Castellanos is tiny and runs around a lot. So they changed the offense a lot. And even on a week-to-week basis, there was a lot of moving parts of, okay, this week we're doing this, this week we're doing this. Um, and it worked for the most part. I would say that, you know, weird things happen. You know, they, they take Florida State to the brink despite committing a program record number of penalties and falling down by three scores in the middle of the second half. Uh, they get blown up by Louisville. Um, and then you know, a lot of one-score games. And some of them are closer than the others. Like the Virginia game was very strange. Uh, the Army game was played in a monsoon. Um, Syracuse game. And at some point now, I can't exactly remember when. I think oh, it's the UConn game. So in the UConn game, Thomas Castellanos weirdly goes out of the game around halftime. And they won't really say why. And eventually he does come back in the game. And we were led to believe initially that it was dehydration. Come, We come to find out a few months later that he had a issue with his non-throwing shoulder. And if you watch the games around those times, it was very clear that he was running a lot more gingerly, which affected the offense because of how much they used him as a designed runner and a scrambler. And that led to a lot of issues in kind of that middle end part of the season. And then by the time you get to the bowl game, even though that is also played in the monsoon, he's looking a lot more aggressive as a runner, more uh, better as a thrower. So that's part of it. But back to the mental load thing. This is something that I'm still tracking. This is something we're not really going to know until the games start getting played is I'm interested to see how much of are we installing Bill O'Brien's offense where it's this, you know, spread out. It's a true pro style passing attack um, versus how much is he actually integrating stuff that is more just comfortable for the guys who who were on the roster last year. You know, do I think they're going to have as many sets where they come out with eight offensive linemen on the field and just run quarterback power, Thomas Castellanos? No, that's probably out of the playbook. But from what I've seen in practice, it seems like there's going to be a lot of pistol, a lot of play action to move the quarterback, um, some RPO stuff, screen stuff out of that. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what they do, because I think it's going to be a blending of a lot of offensive families that if Thomas Castellanos takes the next step forward, in terms of decision-making and accuracy, especially short accuracy, because that was something where he was really insistent on, and then not forcing these aggressive throws that lead to interceptions that were a problem because he did have a lot of turnovers. Like, you can't deny that. But with Thomas Castellanos, you can't... There, there was a, there were some rumors of a quarterback competition with uh, FIU transfer Grayson James. At our website, we never really give them any credence because you can't take Thomas Castellanos off the field because of his nature for explosive plays. And also, and this, you know... You might say this is just like kind of team put out media hokum, but having like seen him in person a few times, he really does have one of those personalities that guys just gravitate towards. You can feel that he is a leader who guys just want to follow. So I think that if he is able to take that next step in his second year here, and there's been a lot of studies about, or not studies, but just like research about when a guy transfers his second year in the program, he usually takes a big step forward, ostensibly the, if the offense is the same, which it isn't necessarily that he has had a lot of offensive changes over the last few years of his career. Um, so I'm hoping that this whole offseason where he is the undisputed starter, he's getting all the reps, the ones he is going to take that next step forward as a passer. All right. So maybe that means more, more uh, running with the backs. And I I've seen a lot of good things about Kyro Roba show in, in, mm-hmm. in uh, fall practice. Plus see, they, they picked up the transfer. I, I forget what school he came from board and the state previously for the state. state, but he was with Florida. Yeah. Yeah. So it feels like, you know, they, if they want to take the load, at least in the run game off of, off of Castellanos, they have, they have options to do that with. Yes. I think that's what they want to do. And to his credit, O'Brien, when he has had quarterbacks that, can run he has used it occasionally like when he had deshaun watson with the texans he didn't do it as much with bryce young who has a relatively similar body type to castellanos but it's it's a little part of the offense but yeah i think i actually think trishon ward is going to be the starter because he is more of the bill o'brien offense that you know if you think about the patriots offense he's kind of that more versatile back that can be a receiver out of the backfield um and he adds a little more explosiveness and maybe he's not a great home run hitter but if you watch kyroba show last year he is more of a straight line hammer up the middle back. And if you've, if you've got the perfect lane for him, he can go, but he's not going to outrun many people. So I think what they want to do is, you know, to get and borrow from the Patriots is kind of reminiscent of the James White slash Deion Lewis and then LeGarrette Blunt kind of duo where you have the guy who can be versatile, be a little explosive, shifty or in the early parts of the game. And then when the defense is tired, bring in the hammer that can close out the game. 
So the receiving core, at least, is led by Lewis Bond, who probably had twice as many catches as anybody else on mm -hmm. the team. Uh, who else is primed to step up out of the receivers this year? So, yeah, this room was a bit of a sore spot last year, but I would say that a lot of the guys that were the biggest issues are now gone. Um, you have Jaden Williams, who transferred to Texas State, who was one of the most maddeningly inconsistent players I've ever watched. Joseph Griffin, who was great as a freshman, really struggled last year, and I think injuries played a part. He's now at Wisconsin. But you bring in a guy, Jaron Bradley from Texas Tech, who was a uh, freshman All-American in 2012, or sorry, 2022, um, he had injuries last year and they had a lot of quarterback issues. So he couldn't really, uh, he couldn't really figure it out last year because there was just a lot of moving pieces. Break him in, he's 6'5, 220, big X style receiver is going to win downfield in test to catch situations. Uh, he's been nicked up through practice a bit. So I'm interested to see how he starts the year. Um, Lewis Bond is probably going to be the slot in the slot most of the time as the F receiver. And then the Z is probably going to be a uh, sophomore, Jaden Skeet, who, because they had other guys that were older, he didn't get as much playing time early in the season. But as the season progressed, guys got hurt. Uh, he kind of came on and had some very impressive plays down the stretch. Um, he's bulked up a lot. I think they they kind of, uh, I believe it was wide receivers coach Daryl Wyatt, who he was comparing the wide receiver room to a basketball team. And he was saying, you know, so we have post players, we have printer players, we have guards. And he said that Jaden Skeet, who's 6'2", 196, I think, or 191, is more of the post type players, which was surprising to me. Um, the other transfer they picked up was Jaden McGowan from Vanderbilt, who tiny guy, but super speedy. His name is Shaky. He was a uh, all SEC kick returner, I think, at Vanderbilt. So I'm not sure he's going to start, but they're going to have to get in the ball just because of how explosive he is. He's also an absolute cheat code in the EA college football video game just because of his speed. Like you hit that guy on an RPO bubble in the flat. Nobody's stopping him. He's great. Um, but again, I'm not sure he's going to start. And then uh, you got Dino Tomlin, Mike Tomlin's son, who. Listen, I'm not sure he's an NFL future, but he is a fun college player because he makes contested catches, he runs hard after the ball, and he blocks. So he's, he's a hard guy to keep off the field, but, and, and he's useful. And the tight end position is going to be a really – going a, a big overhaul this year because George Takis, who's been here for the last two years, was brought in mostly via blocking tight end, which he was very good at last year, but he also struggled with injuries, and he had a lot of really bad drops. So they bring in Kamari Morales from North Carolina, who saw his playing time dwindle over the last few years, but he is a – very reliable receiver, especially over the middle. And so if they're going to take a step back at blocking at the tight end position, but I think Kamari Morales could have a big year um, as that, you know, safety blanket over the middle and perhaps even in the red zone. This offensive line is le led by Ozzy Trapillo, who was uh, all ACC last season. Plus you've got uh, Drew Kendall at center, who was freshman All-American a couple of years ago. And it feels like this is still a pretty quality O-line. Yeah, so... <laughs> It depends on who you ask. So, yeah. yes, you do have Ozzy Trapila, who I do think is – I think it was a travesty that he wasn't all ACC first-team offense tackle. Um, he's really good. He's really developed in the last uh, two years that he's been the starter. Drew Kendall, the freshman All-American thing was a – I think a, I think it was one outlet and it was I think it was a bit of a charitable thing because that year again he was not he didn't have anybody around him so it was a struggle as his first year as a starter but he has made massive strides since then um so that that's good to see he's also bulked up because he came to school he was like 250 pounds so he's up near 300 now finally the problem is is with this line is you are losing two NFL caliber guards. You're losing Trisha Mahogany, who was a six round pick to the Lions. He should have gone higher. And Kyle Hergel, who was a UDFA to the Saints. And I'm not sure if he's made the team, but and my, both were all ACC selections last year. And some people may find this hard to believe, but when you lose two players like that, unless you're Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, what have you, you're probably not going to replace them with better players. And that's just the nature of the beast. So, what they're doing is they are taking last year's left tackle, Logan Taylor, who they've brought in over Virginia and played quite well at left tackle, I would say. They're moving him inside to guard, and they're replacing him at left tackle with Jude Bowery, who is a redshirt sophomore, very athletic, great feet, just hasn't you know, hasn't gotten to play a lot and has had some injury issues. And at right guard, they're putting in Jack Conley, who's been here forever. He's huge, but he has not looked great when he's had to play, especially at tackle, so hopefully putting him at guard should be better. In the backups they've got, they're all like redshirt senior graduate student guys who have been around a while. None of them have been that great, but they're they're usually big and they know what they're and they kind of know what they're doing. So you hope that again, obviously hope no injuries occur, but if you do, you have guys who have a good amount of experience that can slide in for ideally just a game or two. There have been recent injuries to Taylor and Bauer on the left side. Taylor has not gotten to practice a ton. Bowery recently had a little injury, but it seems like from what Bill O'Brien has said that both should be ready 
for Florida State. They're probably not going to be 100%, but they're probably good enough to play. Will they be able to be good enough to play and perform well against Florida State's defensive line? We'll see. Let's take a deep breath for a second. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of information there. So we'll just take a, a little bit of a break here because I'm going to ask you about what's your favorite place to eat game day. Because, I, the, you know, if somebody's traveling, coming to see a game, they want to know a great place to go. So any recommendations? So you go to Boston, you can probably find decent seafood almost anywhere. Um, and I have not lived there in a while, so I probably if, the places I can think of probably have changed. However, there is one place that is decently close to the BC campus. It's called Eagles Deli. Mm -hmm. It's a burger restaurant and it's famous for they have like the burger challenges where you can get, you know, a stacked burger that's like, you know, four pounds of meat, you know, 16 pieces of cheese, what have you. Sure to kill you. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I would recommend that you don't have to get the challenge, but their other burgers they have are excellent um they're half pound burgers very thick very juicy um usually you'll you'll catch bc students in there a decent bit usually you'll sometimes you'll see uh football players and athletes there because it's a it's a big meal if you want to get a lot of protein and carbs um but i, th I think it was on i want to say man versus food on one of the cooking oh, channels so okay. yeah. it's it has a bit of a reputation um and i i know i was i was there recently and i did see it so that is still there it's also next to what I would say is the best pizza place around BC, which is Pino's Pizza. It's an institution. It's been there forever. You know, it's it's nothing like crazy special, but it's like if you want just a good classic slice of cheese or pepperoni, that's your place to go. Sounds like a good recommendation to me. Making me hungry. I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> uh, I know where to, to stop now. Let's jump into uh, defense, and then we'll take a quick look at uh, special teams right after that. Yeah, so – Defense is going to be interesting because obviously Jeff Happley is gone. He had a pretty big hand in court and structuring the defense was what they did. You know, over the last four years, BC has been one of the most uh, single high coverage teams in all of college football. Um, so single high one safety deep. So you're going to cover one, cover three. They've also been super aggressive when it comes to man coverage. I think last year they were third highest in man coverage. And that's always been Jeff Happley's MO. We're doing single high coverage. We're doing, a lot of man because we want to stop the run and force quarterbacks to throw difficult throws to the outside. Now, the problem with his scheme is that it is predicated on having equal or better talent than the team you're facing. Generally, Boston College does not have that. So it had mixed results. <laughs> Sometimes against bad opponents, it would work great. Against better opponents, it would be have a real problem. Um, and especially when the offense would kind of peter out for, you know, 2021, bad quarterback play, 2022, there's no offensive line. You know, puts a lot of stress on the defense because they have to keep going out there and keep getting stops for an offense that's completely in the dumps. So you bring in Tim Lewis and Tim Lewis was a very surprising name when he got hired because he has been basically retired from coaching for a little while. He's been in the UFL and the XFL, the minor leagues for the last few years, but haven't heard his name. Uh, he was a defensive coordinator for the Steelers and the Giants in the early 2000s, then kind of became a position coach and then just kind of, you know, faded away. Nobody really heard from him. So he's an, he's an older defensive coordinator, you know, hasn't coached college football I would say since the nineties. So it's obviously changed a lot since he's been there. Uh, but what we're hoping is that basically he introduces a defense that is just more complex and not as married to specific ideas because towards the end of Jeff Halfley's tenure, it felt like defenses knew exactly what they were, what the defense was, or, sorry, offenses knew exactly what the defense was going to do and they knew ways to identify and exploit it. So it kind of just became open season for them. So that's what we're hoping with that. In terms of personnel, the defensive line returns almost everybody. They have, they have one reserve defensive tackle who played a little bit. He's being replaced by an Illinois transfer. Uh, left to right, from the offense's perspective, you're getting Nidowick Paula, Cam Horsley, George Rooks, and Donovan Ezeraku. And this is a bit of a difficult unit to talk about because last year they ranked 30th in pressure rate. So they pressured opposing quarterbacks on 35.4% of their dropbacks, but they were 130th in sacks. They had 13 sacks, exactly one per game on average. So, and if you watch the games, you can kind of see why, because they played a lot of mobile quarterbacks who were able to evade the pass rush. They sometimes they just got bad luck where they would hit the quarterback, but he would just get the ball away. So it's not a sack. And other times they would just miss sacks in the backfield because of bad angles or what have you. Nevertheless, that's a problem that has to be fixed. You can't have only 13 sacks on a season. And based on just the natural laws of life and math and regression, they're going to have more sacks this year. So that's numbers going to go up. And 
you know, does it double? And if if they had if they just got two sacks per season, that would have been tied for 76th instead of 100 instead of 130th. So that any getting that number into anywhere near the average would be a massive improvement. Um, linebacker is mostly the same, but the issue. So you're losing veteran linebacker Vinny De Palma, who's been here since 2018. He's just like the classic college linebacker. You know, doesn't wear gloves, doesn't have any adornment on his arms. Um, you know, 5'10", 230, loves defending the run, really does a great job, you know, get hitting guys, but he's an athletic liability. So on one hand, you're losing smarts, experience, instincts, toughness, but you're bringing in somebody who's a better athlete. And his replacement is likely going to be Davion Bam Crouch, who has only much mostly played special teams the last two years, but in the, towards the end of last year, he got some more defensive playing time and I would say impressed. The issue with this room is you've got two linebackers who are probably not good. They're going to be very limited this year. One is Bryce Steele, who missed all of last year, and he's still working back because he was diagnosed with, I'm not exactly sure the type, but it was cancer. I believe it was leukemia. And so he has been cleared to play and he's been practicing, but he hasn't played football in almost two years. So they're bringing him along slowly. The other reserve is Jalen Blackwell, who played the first half of last year, but then suffered injury and I think is still working back. So the two other linebackers that you're relying on are Owen McGowan, who is basically a Vinny De Palma clone, and Sione Riz Hala, who is kind of a safety hybrid. So you have two very hyper-specific players there, and that's your depth, and that's pretty much it. So if there's injuries there, that's going to be a problem. Secondary is almost completely overhauled, um, because, and, and actually they have a lot of depth, at least guys who have played a, good, a decent bit and are interesting. So you have Amari Jackson as the only returning starter cornerback, and he was playing very well last year, I would say, until their other cornerback, Elijah Jones, got suspended and then he had to become the number one cornerback and he struggled towards the end of the year because now you're playing better receivers. And also the uh, rest of the secondary had a lot of injuries, so he didn't have a lot of help around him. Across from him is probably going to be Max Tucker, who's a true sophomore, who surprisingly, you know, when he came up, he played a little bit here and there in the beginning of last year, took over more playing as the year went on and had some pretty impressive moments, had some ones that were questionable, but he beat out two transfers they brought in to shore up the depth of this room. He beat out Brightface Brown, who transferred from Georgia State. He started there for two years. He's the brother of Bruce Brown uh, for, I always forget what team he plays for now, but he was on the Nuggets. I want to say he's on the Pacers now, um, but I can't remember that exactly. And then another one was Ryan Turner, who they transferred from Ohio State. And they also got uh, Cameron Martinez from Ohio State, who was a Jeff Hathley recruit to Ohio State back in the day but he just couldn't really find playing time because Ohio State recruits tons of really good defensive backs. So it, it can be forgiven with those two guys. At safety, they're converting Jalen Cheek, who has been a corner. He was a slot player last year, and now he's moving to safety. And then KP Price, who's a true sophomore, who, again, came on later in the year, but played really well for a true freshman last year. So very high hopes for him. Um, also looking at Bug Jones, who's been like a special teams maven for them for years, and he's getting a decent amount of playing time. Um, so there's a lot of bodies there. Uh, Kari Johnson, sorry, another one. He transferred in last year from Arkansas, had a lot of like minor injuries, so he just couldn't get on the stay on the field. And then I think the one game where he was finally healthy, if you look this up, it was against Pitt. He got ejected for targeting where he looked like a salmon jumping out of a river and but leading with his head against a defenseless receiver. Um, he is supposedly going to be the starting slot defender. So there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of new faces, guys in different positions, but you're hoping that because there's so much depth, there's so much competition that there it'll breed quality, I'm sorry, not quality, competent play in the secondary, uh, which wasn't the case in games against Louisville, Miami, or Louisville, Virginia Tech, and Miami, where they were just awful. So you're hoping that, again, a, a defensive scheme that is more forgiving on the defensive backs and, you know, forces the opposing offense to think more and actually, actually read what the defense is. You're hoping that makes life easier for secondary and honestly, the defense as a whole. Sounds good. Um, Will. All right, let's take a quick look at special teams. This is going to be an interesting season for the, for the Eagles. I, I remember the name Sam Candati as, as punter. I feel like he's been around for a while, for a couple of years. And then, Place kicker, I, I I don't know. I forget. I didn't, I can't remember the Boston College's kicker's name. I'm sorry to say, but well, that's that's fine because it used to be Connor Litton, and now it's Liam Connor. That's so what it is. there's there's a bit of there there's is a Connor, some, you know, there's a Connor thing. Yeah, there's there's <laughs> some confusion, and you know you mess you mess up the names or people mess up the name. I still do it where you just say the wrong ones. So which Connor is it? Um, but yeah, Connor Litton took over last year. Uh, Liam Connor, 
no, sorry. There I went. Liam Connor took over last year because Connor Linton had an injury and he was fine. They didn't really ask him to kick super long field goals. I think he was five of, he was either three of five or five of eight from 40 plus. Didn't kick anything from 50 plus. So you're hoping, you know, you're hoping, you know, he doesn't have to do it, but you're hoping that he gets a little better there. This will be Sam Candotti. I guess it's technically his third season as the starter. Um, he's a bit of a, an interesting player because he's, you know, one of those Australian punters, but he is, Pretty much just a he is a placement accuracy punter. He does not have that strong of a leg. Um, that's what he was when he came in as a true freshman. Basically, if it was you know at the fifty and they were too it was too far to go for it, they would have him you know pooch kick it basically. And he did a pretty good job of you know pinning offenses uh, inside their own territory. Apparently, last year also down the stretch he was dealing with an injury that kind of limited his kicking power. So I'm wondering if now that that's resolved, he'll have some more power. I'm a little questionable of that. Um, so I, I'm, I do not have high hopes for the special teams room in terms of being able to consistently, positively affect games. I'm just hoping they don't ruin games, which has been the case for BC special teams in the past. In terms of the return game, I'm excited for the return game because like I said, Jane McGowan comes in for Vanderbilt, had some very good kick returns at Vanderbilt, great speed. Um, they've got another guy named Nate Johnson, who's a smaller guy. He doesn't, he doesn't play much on offense, but he is another super speedy guy. And then I think Lewis Bond is going to stick as the punt returner because, with Lewis Bond, and this kind of goes back to him on the offense, his best skill is his ability to create yards after catch and yards after contact. He's a former running back, so he just has this feel for space and ability to manipulate angles. And he's 5'11", 199, but I don't know what it is, but like guys just bounce off him. Like he has a way to just like make his body go limp in the right place where he can just like stay upright, spin out of tackles. So I think he could be really useful as a punt returner. And ideally, if Jaden McGowan can give them anything on kick returns because for the last few years, it's been a nightmare on kick returns, just never getting plus field position. That could be a huge thing for BC's offense where they don't have to go 80, 85 or, you know, 80, 75 yards every drive. Right. You want to finish with the schedule, Jim? Tough, a tough way to go. Um, and speaking of a tough way to go, um, starting out with uh, FSU on the schedule is, uh, especially after FSU's debut, um, not a pleasant situation having to to go to Tallahassee. Um, my my biggest question here, and there's a lot of games on here I'm looking at, and I'm thinking, yeah, I I, I think Boston College is going to do okay in a lot of situations. Um, but tell me what you think. Is this a is this a bowl team? I think they are going to be right on the edge. I for me, looking at this BC team. I think there are a lot of questions that could produce a very wide range of outcomes. So the, in the prime, so there are, you know, how does Thomas Castellanos progress as a passer? How does the offensive line perform with new starters and possible injuries? And can the pass rush become an actual thing again? And just what does the, what is the secondary going to be? Can they be average? Can they be above average? Are they going to be slightly below average? Are they going to be terrible? It's, it's, it's a whole gamut of things that could happen. So it's just hard to predict at this point. And because of that, you know, you look at a lot of games on the schedule that I would qualify as like toss ups where you could say like the win probability is between anywhere between like 40 and 60 percent where it's like if and BC was pretty lucky in one score games last year, you know, regardless of what actually happened, they won a lot of them. And some of them were against pretty, you know, they won by two points against Holy Cross. They barely beat Syracuse on the road when they were playing their backup quarterback on on a short week. Uh, they barely beat Army. Granted, the game is played in a monsoon, but still uh, they, they only beat UConn by a touchdown and again, Castellanos got hurt that game, but still, you have all these in the tight game against Virginia, where there was a questionable Harold Mary. They had two turnovers in their own on their own side of the field in the second half. So you have all these weird games where they did end up winning. So does the luck switch back this year, especially against a harder schedule? I think that BC as a team will be more consistent and probably better than they were last year. But because they are facing a harder schedule, I could see them doing worse. So looking at the schedule, FSU looks more beatable now, but this is that was also a wake up call for FSU. I don't think they're going to play like they did against Georgia Tech. So on the one hand, it's like, hey, maybe there's a better chance. But also, I think Florida State's going to be pretty locked in to get back in the win column. Duquesne FCS game. That's a win on the road at Missouri. That's that's like as much a guarantee loss as I can say, because you're playing against the best wide receiver in college football, an excellent quarterback in the SEC. Like they're, I think they're just going to tear BC to shreds just because their secondary is just not going to be ready for that at this point. Western Kentucky feel pretty or sorry, Michigan State. 
Michigan State's another tough team to predict. New coach, almost a completely new roster. I think they have 40, they have like 29 players leave and 40 come in for the portal. So it's it's a whole new team. And they have a, a, a true sophomore quarterback who has never started a game. So I feel good at the, that's It's at BC. I believe that's going to be the red bandana game. So I would just lean BC, but not strong. Um, after that, Western Kentucky. Conference USA is the worst conference in college football and the FBS. They were okay last year. They lost most of their best players. I feel pretty good about that one. At Virginia, I think they probably, I, I still think they're better than Virginia. I don't think Tony Elliott's a very good coach. So I think that that's going to be a pretty strong win for them. Then you kind of get these weird bye week situations where you, so then if you have a bye week, then you go on the road to Virginia Tech on a short week. I'd like Virginia Tech a lot this year. So I would say that's a loss. Then you go home against Louisville. Louisville is another tough team to predict because I like Jeff Brown a lot as a coach, but that team is completely different than last year too. And Tyler Shuck has never been able to start more than seven games in a season. This is the eighth game of the season. So, you know, if you're betting, you, you would bet on Tyler Shuck not to be in that game. And you have another bye week, you get Syracuse at home. You know, after our experience with a head coach who has never been anything more than a co-coordinator, I'm questionable of Fran Brown's ability in terms of an in-game coaching thing. And I would imagine that Bill O'Brien can coach circles around him. So I feel good about that one, but it's still a pretty, I would say, in the toss-up range. Uh, after that, you've got, I think, on the road at SMU. SMU had a tough week zero. I think that's, I'm gonna, I'm talking, again, I, I'm kind of taking these week zero games with a grain of salt. It's like, it's, it's the first game of the season. Yeah. Things go weird. Uh, you may maybe not take an opponent seriously. They still won. I think that's a bit of a toss because I think SMU is going to be want revenge for the bowl game last year. They're also, uh, are they coming up? They're coming off a bye in that game. Then UNC, they've got a lot of talent, but if you look at Mac Brown's record in November against, against uh, FBS, specifically ACC teams, it's terrible. Those teams always fade down the stretch. And now he doesn't have a top five quarterback on his team. And they, they don't even know who the quarterback is right now. It's like, I think it's, still a competition between three guys. So I think UNC is probably the better team, but because they don't have a quarterback and Mac Brown's coaching record, I think BC could definitely win that game. Uh, season finale home against Pitt. I feel really good about that one. I've, there's some people that are like kind of high on Pitt this year. I don't get it at all. Their offense one was awful last year. They're all back. Like they might be a little bit better. They, they don't, they don't know who their quarterback is. Uh, and their defense, they lost almost, they lost their entire defensive line. They lost two, sorry, they lost three really good cornerbacks. Uh, most linebacker rooms knew like, and I, I honestly think by that game, I think there's a very good chance that Narduzzi is out by that game. And, Cause I think, I think he, uh, we know how anathema he is to offense. And I think, I think the new offense is going to work for a few weeks and then it's not. And then he's gonna be like, all right, no, stop. We're, we're just going to run the ball. And then they're going to be like, okay, we're done with this. Like we need to actually win a football game. So I think there's a chance he is either out or that team has just quit. So I am on the fence between five and seven, six and six, maybe swing a seven and five if, if everything goes well. Uh, but again, there's just so many questions and so many, uh, such a wide range of outcomes with this team at so many important places where it's like, I can't really confidently say, okay, yeah, they're definitely going to win eight more games or they're going to be so bad that they, like, this is going to be a terrible first year. Uh, it's an, it's, it's frustrating that there is a tough schedule in Bill O'Brien's first year, but I think that if they can, beat expectations, go six and six, maybe seven and five with a tough schedule. Then you can really build on that for next year and the future of the Bill O'Brien era. Yeah. Good, re good recruiting poster material right there. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? Well, you just hit, hit, hit on what I was mm -hmm. just going to ask. Uh, you talked to, we mentioned the recruiting piece. How is, how's recruiting going in, as far as looking into 2025? I think that they are, mm. So I, I don't cover recruiting as closely, but uh, my editor at the site, he is much more into it. So I get all the updates from him. I think that they are running into some roadblocks right now. I think they, right now, if I remember correctly, they are not, they didn't get as many offensive linemen as they wanted, but they are really hammering defensive line and defensive back. So they, they're they doing solid. I think that they probably need a decent year this year to really kick, get that kick started. They do have their quarterback of the future in this class. Uh, Shaker Risa got up Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, but I think uh, they have some, I think they have some younger dynamic, uh, positional coaches that are really helping them recruiting, namely Ray Brown, the defensive backs coach and, uh, Savon Huggins, the running backs coach are guys that are, they're younger coaches. And I think they're doing a really good job of connecting with local recruits. So, you know, I don't think they're gonna have like a, I mean, BC very rarely has higher than a, you know, 40th ranked class. Um, and I don't think that's gonna be the case this year, this year, but I think that they're, I think right now they're basically trying to backfill this roster because there's a lot of, there are a lot of like older players who are still, who are going to be around this year and maybe even next year. So they're kind of just trying to stock the back of the cupboard so that, 
you know, kind of has a more consistent cycle of players. Um, so then maybe they don't have to rely on the portal as much. Sounds good. Great thoughts. Great preview of Boston College. It all starts this week, week one in ACC football, 24-7's Eagle Insider, Mitch Wolf. Thank you for your debut on ACC Nation. We hope to get you back and talk a little more football and who knows what else. Oh, thank you guys so much for having me. As you can tell, I love to come on and just spew information at people. So anytime you need somebody to do that, just give me a call. Oh, good. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks for listening to ACC Nation. Be sure to listen, like, and subscribe to our podcast, radio, and YouTube channels by visiting accnation.net. Follow us on Instagram, X, Facebook, Mastodon, Threads, Blue Sky, and Reddit at ACC Nation. Nation.